Same pattern, Tiki Barber and Brian Dawkins level. That ball went out of here off the top of the wall. Chipper Jones just won the ball game. Excited about this week's Hometown Heroes guest presented by Lockett Law. Know before you blow. Uh, Dan Hicken, Denny Thompson here, and a guy who's Jacksonville through and through, right, Denny? I oh, mean, yeah. Storm Davis oh, yeah. is is one of the best, and we're happy that he agreed to come on and talk to us. Storm, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. Storm, take us back to growing up here in Jacksonville and just your your interest in baseball and where – it started to, you know, where it really started to click. Were you were you good from from five? Were you good from age twelve? Were you? I mean, were you running on little league World Series teams? What was your story growing up? Well, Dad got transferred. My my dad was mm-hmm. with Firestone Tire. And okay, he got we. Dad, and Mama were born and raised in the Dallas, Texas area, and then he moved here, got transferred. Uh, University Christian opened up in the early seventies. And so we, we rented homes over kind of close to junior uh, Southside Junior High there for a couple of years. And then when UC opened, uh, Dad started over there with football and baseball, but obviously I wasn't ready to do that. So as a little leaguer, he, he put me over the nearest little league to us at the time was, uh, was the Southside Twins. And uh, I was not allowed to play with my age group because I threw too hard. That's what he told me. I don't remember that. <laughs> So I was uh, – I can go back to maybe six or seven, uh, and I could not play with the six-year-olds. I always kind of had to play up a year or two mm-hmm. until I got to about ten. And then and then I could play against guys my own age. Uh, we bounced around. We went over to Glen Leah, then to San Jose, San Susi. I grew up in the south side area, and then when I was able to uh, – Get to the varsity. There's no junior varsity or varsity back in the day at UC. It was just kind of like uh, from the seventh grade on, you know, if you were good enough to play, that's there was a varsity. So that's kind of where it all started. Uh, Coach Brown obviously had a very uh, impactful on my life there at UC. And dad and dad wasn't big into the mechanics part. He just kind of came home from Firestone until he took the full-time job at UC. He just sat on a bucket in the backyard and <laughs> – <laughs> uh, would tell me to hit the glove. Hey, hit the glove. So I would kind of figure out from a delivery standpoint what I needed to do to hit the glove, and he kind of nod his head as Denny knows uh, my dad was a man of few words, so he just kind of – that's the way we did it, and uh, we figured it out. And um, I, I loved my Little League days. That was a lot of fun, man. We had some good we had some good teams, and and then it led into UC, and, and then we went from there. So Storm and I have so many tie-ins that right. we'll, we'll kind of get into um, as we go forward. But his dad was one of my favorite people that I've ever been around. Mm-hmm. From a, from an age of, I mean, I was 14, I guess, the first time I met uh, Coach Davis. And, um, you know, one of those coaches that you just maintain the relationship. And Storm's exactly right. Like, very few words, but when he spoke, it was even – he could speak at any level, right? He could speak at to a 14-year-old. He could speak to 60-year-old, whatever it was. Um, I've got chill, Storm, just, just thinking about that relationship and the impact that your dad had on my life. Well, you know, at his funeral, uh, it was held there. The service was held at the church there at university. And, wow, Denny, you know, I knew he impacted a lot of lives, but – at the service and then at the graveside and mm-hmm. for about a week or two afterwards, I got so many uh, phone calls and texts and, and guys, he did things that I obviously like a lot of men in that era, just, uh, just really didn't want to bra- bring attention to themselves and did a lot for people that I never knew. And uh, I found out a lot about my dad that he did things for people. And that's just who he was like, you know, dad just 
wasn't about the spotlight. Um, and I was really, really good for me to grow up underneath a man like that because I didn't know where God was going to take me on my, my journey with baseball, but he made it, he just lived it in front of me. Like, it's not about me. It's not about you, Storm. It's about others. And then as a coach, he was very selfless in that and that it was always about his players and not about him. Storm, was he was he harder on you because, you know, you were his son than others? Or what, what uh, when we talk about George Davis, uh, uh, Storm's dad, who was a coach, longtime coach in this area, and obviously I knew him media-wise and just – what a great, you know, nice man he was. But these two guys could go on and on. But I, I'm just curious, the father-son relationship that you had with him. No. You know, we spoke very little about what he expected of me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I just always knew that um, he, he required my best. And mm-hmm. a God had given me a little bit more than most, and I hope that doesn't sound arrogant. No. But I knew that God had given me a talent. And he required that I do the best with it. Um, he never once told me that w- my goal was Major League Baseball. He, his only thing I remember him saying to me along those lines were, "I need you. You need to work as hard as you can, so maybe you can get your college paid for someday." That was all. Mm-hmm. As, as far as a, an outside pressure thing, I never felt any pressure from Dad, but. Um, it's just like, I need you to do your best. And that's all he really required of me. And that was kind of cool. Let's talk, let's, let's, we'll circle back around to some of that stuff. Cause I, I could, I could sit here and talk all day about that stuff, but, um, let's get into your career. You're at, you went to university Christian. Um, obviously that's a link we both have, I both love university Christian, um, dominated there. Next thing you know, what happens from there? Like what, where, where do you go from university Christian? How do you end up from there to pitching in a World Series. (laughs) Right. Uh, 1979, I was drafted in the seventh round by the uh, Baltimore Orioles. I went to, uh, we call it short season now, but it was rookie ball then in in the Appalachian League. Was there uh, that summer. A ball was in Miami, which was a part of the Florida State League in 1980. 1981, I was in AA with Charlotte, which was in the Southern League at the time. Uh, And then I almost made the major league team. I got put on the 40 man after that year in 1981. Wow. That's quick. uh, Yeah. Yeah. It went by fast. Uh, I I mean, I can remember in spring training of 1982, you know, the, the, the dudes with the high numbers on their backs are like way back in the back of the locker room. (laughs) I was, I was the last guy back there for like 10 days. And like, uh, I didn't really know, all my friends had been cut or sent back to the minor league complex. And I'm just back there by myself. And, uh, Weaver called me in when he, when they, when they sent me down and he said, uh, you won't be down very long. And he said, I need you to do, he goes, well, this is what you need to do. He said, I need you to throw strikes. And I was the simple thing. Like, Hey dude, I can throw strikes. And I was a two pitch pitcher. Um, I didn't really, it took me probably, almost the length of my career in the big leagues to figure out other ways to move the ball off the barrel, which in turn has made me, a, a uh, as a coach, I can understand that a little bit better. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I uh, got called up in 82, um, got sent back down, got called back up in May to stay. So, and then the next year we were fortunate enough to, uh, I beat the White Sox in the American League Championship, and then we beat the Phillies in the 1983 World Series. So, it, yes, it went by fast. Uh, I, my recollection, it's almost like if you were on a ride and it's going a little too fast, you can't remember every right. bump or nick tranny. That, that's how it is with me in my mind. It just it, That part of it went by a little fast. Now, I was around some Hall of Famers, uh, Palmer, <laughs> well, and then – Ripken Jr. And, and Eddie. Eddie didn't talk a lot. But anyway, I asked a lot of questions, as, as many as I felt like I could ask, that I wasn't, you know, stepping over the back. Because I, I was a fan. I was in awe of these guys. You know, I I grew up watching Jim Palmer and those guys. Sure. My, dad, my dad's favorite team was the Orioles. So I, uh, I, it took me a little while to get over that part of it. Like, they're teammates. They're not idols to be like, or, you know, I, it took me a little while to get over that, but I did. 
Take but it was kind of cool. It went by fast, and then the next thing you know, you're rolling, and they put a ring on you. <laughs> Take me to the uh, the World Series game and the enormity of it. And were you too young to realize that, or you know, I just have a job to do, or what was that? Uh, what was that moment like for you, pitching, uh, starting a game in the uh, Fall Classic? I, I think it didn't hit me, Dan, until the day before. I, I, uh, I'm pretty sure my day was Saturday. Okay. Uh, Howard Cosell interviewed me, <laughs> and I couldn't. I couldn't get over the fact that Howard Cosell was going to interview Davis me. Storm Davis is Star here. <laughs> there it is. That's it. You know, I'm just some little dweeb from Jacksonville, Florida, and Howard Cosell is going to interview me. I'm like, wow. I, I had to. There are a lot of things for first for me. I had like, wow, this is really happening to me. I tried to act cool being interviewed by Howard Cosell. I was on the inside. I was not cool. Mm -hmm. I was, I was, uh, let's just say very anxious, nervous. Um, I don't remember much about, I don't think I slept a lot the night before got to the park. Um, I mean, the lineup, it goes Rose Morgan and Schmidt. So it's like, <laughs> man, these dudes are really good, man. These dudes are good. And uh, I'm just a two-pitch guy. You know, how am I going to get these guys out? Right. And, uh, Palmer gave me good advice just to, you know, just stay with your strength. You know, uh, kind of like when to use the curveball, or particularly early in counts. Uh, I went five. Um, off the belly pitch hit for me. My spot came up in the top of the six with the bases loaded and Ken Singleton pinch hit for me. So I was just, I mean, again, it, it's like you're out there, but you're, it's kind of an out of body thing. And guys say that, but that is the absolute truth. Sure. I mean, you're, you're going on adrenaline and you're going on. I mean, I, I'd, I'd never been in front of uh, maybe once after that. Uh, I'd never been a stadium that loud before. Um, in the American league, we played in the, and we didn't have any of those new, bowl kind of things like the Phillies right. and the Braves, kind of everybody and the sound stayed in there. And the only other time I think it got that loud in my career is when I was playing I think it was the eighty nine, we played the Blue Jays in the in the American League playoffs. Oh wow. And they closed the roof and it that's the only other time where the noise um like the ground shook and the that I remember that in Philadelphia. I remember first of all, I've never heard fans I heard words I had never heard before. I mean, <laughs> the way they use cuss words and the way they blend it, I was like, that's phenomenal. And that was coming like from 10-year-old kids. So um, that was <laughs> fascinating that they that, that they could do that. But that's it was a, quite a moment, and, and it was a lot of nervous. I was nervous, but thank God I was able to get through it. Yeah. I feel like we, we talked to – or former players, NFL players mm -hmm. especially – and it's, man, don't you wish you were playing now because of the money, right? right. There's such a big money difference. And there is in baseball mm -hmm. as well. But, Storm, you played, like, in a much better era, like the golden era of sold-out stadiums, right? And and there wasn't a game on TV unless you were, well, I guess were the Cubs on then? I guess they WGN sure. was a thing. Yeah. Right? I, would you trade yeah. the era for the money, or was the era just so much fun that, that it's just a different game now than what it was then. No, I, I, I wouldn't trade it for the money because the relationships that I had with the men that impacted my life, not only as a, as a man and as a, as a player, um, the life lessons that I learned. I mean, I played for uh, three Hall of Fame managers. I played for Sparky Anderson, uh, Tony La Russa, and Earl Weaver. I, I mean, it's not like that. I leaned in a lot into their office, but then I was around such great. I was around Tony Gwynn. I was around George Brett. Wow. Kyle Jeez. Ripken Jr., Eddie Murray. Uh, I mean, and then, and then uh, we will probably get this in, in a minute, but then I circled back 16 years later and got back into it as a coach. Mm -hmm. It's been uh -huh. eight years. And then the, the newer generation of uh, getting to know those players. So, so to answer your question, no, I mean, I, I came in at the right time for me. I, I was uh, really blessed. Uh, Scott McGregor, you know, uh, Mike Flanagan, uh, Jim Palmer, those guys. Cal Ripken Sr. poured so much into me. I mean, I was a 20 year old guy just trying to figure out how to stay afloat. How do I stay in the big leagues? And he really simplified it for me. And I remember many a time on a, 
on a flight and we're, we're flying in and out of places and he just come up and just spend some time with me about, uh, you know, he, he would talk about the Oriole way, which I don't know if they talk about much anymore, but just being really into the details and right. Okay. What are the details for me personally? And then he would explain that to me and that's kind of how it was real simple for me. I'm curious, you've seen it all in, in the game of baseball, and there's so much more we want to talk to you about, but I, I would be remiss. There's a couple things I want to get to with you. Storm Davis uh, is our guest on the Hometown Heroes podcast, brought to you by Lockett Law, Know Before You Blow. Storm, uh, you, you're around youth baseball today, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are um, about it. It can get crazy at times. It can be competitive. There's summer ball. There's high school ball. Uh, you're, you've are you been a part of some you know really good programs. I'm just curious, your overall, as you've watched it evolve through the years, uh, what your thoughts are when you're, when you're at the park and around uh, uh, youth baseball. Right. I, you know, Dan, I think it it harbors back for me just the fundamentals. I, I can watch a team play catch and warm up mm-hmm. and pretty much tell you where I – on the fundamental meter mm-hmm. what the coaches mm-hmm. are getting across with the other team. I, I would be re- – I'd be lying to you if I told you that I thought the fundamentals were, were as uh, important as they used to be. They're not. To most teams. Right. To most programs. Right. right. Uh, it is about testing now. It's about uh, there are just some things the analytic people like to see and know. Yeah, and and I get that. I'm not naive about that. I mean, I when I got back into it as in the player development side, it, it really works. It sure it, it's a good thing. But at the end of the day, uh, it, you have to throw it and catch it. And if you can't throw it and catch it from a team perspective, it it gets you know, baseball doesn't have a clock. You have to get three outs. So fundamentals are always probably going to be a little more important in that sport than any others that use a clock. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I like the, the athletes are much better now nowadays. Mm-hmm. And that's just from the sheer training they do and the private lessons that they get. Um, it can be a little more difficult from the coaching side to tie in the team part of it and, and use it. But, Still knowing that it's a it's an individual sport. Uh, the parents uh, are <laughs> I, I, I just, well. He, he slowed down a little yeah. bit right there, Danny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the, the parents, you know, I was the head coach at Bulls twice. The mm-hmm. first time, I made it an us versus them thing. That was a mistake on my part. Mm-hmm. I, I I didn't handle that the right way. When I came back, the second time, I embraced that part of it. Mm-hmm. And I would smile and listen, knowing that we both have the same interests. We want the best for your son. Right. Uh, I did a little more explaining about what we were going to do, but I had to let them know that their agenda wasn't our agenda. So I had to find – it wasn't what I said, it was how I said it. Mm -hmm. So I think the better coaches nowadays at the levels, uh, particularly the amateur level, is – it's more how you say it than what you say, but you still have to kind of hang on to the fundamentals and, and what you know to be what you have to teach your players for them to be successful. It's so interesting. The fundamentals conversation, we could like dive deep into right. the weeds on this. Right. Um, it's it's very interesting to me, Storm, because a lot has changed. A lot stayed the same, but a lot's changed because there's a lot more money poured into the science of you know, specifically how to throw things. And I noticed I didn't say baseball or football, I said things. Right. And and you start looking at guys like Tom House and and I, I you know, I've gotten the opportunity to 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 kind of piggyback on a lot of his studies and things like that. It has changed so much to the point that Tommy John's surgery is a plus now. Like, I mean that mm-hmm. that is that's I, it's hard to wrap your head around um, not just the medical advances, but the advances in what we know the body to be able to do in the most efficient and fluid way. Um, mm-hmm. Can can you talk about that a little bit? And would do you feel like if you would have grown up in today's era with all of this information, would you have taken to that? Would you have been that coachable of a guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, Danny, and you know this, and Dan, you know this, it all starts from the ground up. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I think – I'm, I'm, uh, when I first became a coach, I was all, I kind of, I, I, the way stuff was kind of where I was because in my era, mm-hmm. 
of pitching, it was from the waist up. We spent a lot of time tinkering with things from the waist up. And now I've found that it's the waist down. Yep. Uh, yeah, there are some things at the top, fundamental-wise, that you've got to tinker with that the analytics guys like to create what you they need to see from a track man perspective or rap soto or the other things they track uh, that can help with that. But I think if you're going to maintain uh, what you're trying to fix in the upper half, you're going to have to really make sure the lower half works efficiently for, and everybody's different. Denny, as you know, everybody's got, everybody's been given a different structure. Yep. Uh, and I think that's where a good coaching can come in. I think you, you have to realize where, this guy might have an advantage over the other guy, and 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 yet, uh, you know, you have to be real specific on you know how what foot pressure is on the back foot and the length of stride and how far you want to close it off to create the the maximum amount of velocity and um, what the ankle needs to look at coming off the rubber. All those things apply now. Back in my day, they would just say, "Hey, just stay back." Well, <laughs> put, put a ton of weight on your back and push. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Storm, you mentioned Larusa a couple times, and, and I want to start to wrap up here with you. We appreciate the time. And, and Storm Davis, our guest here on the Hometown Heroes podcast, brought to you by Locket Law. No, before you blow. It, uh, you, you won, people remember you as an Oriole, mm-hmm. but you won 35 games in two years in Oakland. Yeah. What was West Coast Storm Davis like? What was that? Was that, a, I mean, that's, that's, that's a far cry hair. away from Jackson. The, ah, the hair that. flowing. Oh, he looked good back in the day. <laughs> Come on. You know, so. it, it, I got I to credit Larusa with that because Larusa, I got I uh, I got traded over late August of, um, let's see, that was 86, 87, somewhere in there, 87. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, we have an off day in Baltimore. And I'm going in to throw a simulated game at Memorial Stadium. It's kind of cool. It's been my first six years there, and I'm, I'm throwing a simulated game trying to restart my career because I just was absolutely awful in San Diego. Okay. And, and uh, he pull, he brings me into the office there at Memorial Stadium, and we have a conversation like I've never had with a manager before or anyone that was in that position over me. Mm-hmm. The first thing he says to me was, he goes, hey, I, I hear you're a religious guy. I said, okay, I know where you're coming from. I said, yes, sir. He goes, you got any trouble hitting people? I said, well, like in a retaliation standpoint, I said, I've never been asked to. He goes, well, you're going to be asked to here because you're going to defend your teammates. I said, okay. He goes, but here's the deal. I call it. You don't hit anybody on your own. You t- you hit the people. I tell you who you're going to hit and when you're going to hit them. Uh, okay. And then he says to me, he goes, I need you to grow your hair out. He goes, you look too stuffy. He goes, you need to relax a little bit. He goes, do you drink? I said, no, sir, I don't drink. He goes, well, we got to find a way to mellow you out. Wow. And uh, I was like, I like this dude's like into my soul, like, like within five minutes of conversation. Wow. I'm like, no one's ever talked to me like this before. So I grew my hair out. He goes, you be you. He goes, I don't need you to be any other version of anybody else before those statements became popular and the process started and everything else. He told me, I need you to be you. I don't need you to be Dave Stewart. I don't need you to be anybody else. You be you. And we're going to find a way to make you the best you you can be. And then D- Dave Duncan comes alongside. He puts a two-steamer in my hand, which I'd never really thrown before. Taught me the fork ball. That took me a little while to figure out. And the next thing I know, well, I'm surrounded by a great team. Now, we can hit it, but we yeah. can catch it with the best. And next thing you know, I'm like, and I, I did not want to leave. If the, the A's are guaranteeing me two years, an option with the third year, the Royals offered me three guarantee, and actually the Blue Jays offered me four guarantee. If And I told Sandy Alderson, please just guarantee the third year, and I'm an Oakland A, and, but he wouldn't guarantee. That's that's why I left. I didn't want to leave Oakland. Mm-hmm. Um, but I knew I was going to go through that window one time as a free agent sure. to ask for that kind of money. So I had to – it was just like uh, for my family. So. Oh, yeah. But no, it was great. I mean, and honestly, uh, I've not been around another leader. Uh, I've not I've not been around another leader of men mm-hmm. until I got to Corky Rogers that even came close. Wow. Um, Corky Rogers and Tony, I learned a lot from Corky Rogers, and that could be a whole other podcast. Sure. But, 
I mean, he would bring me in after lunch, and we, he and I would sit in there an hour in the weight room every day, almost every day for years. So people didn't know that, mm -hmm. but I wish I would wrote it down. But I'll remember a lot of it. He and Larusa wow. were very impactful in my life. What an amazing like psychological study that is, like just for confidence, right? Because yeah. Storm just said like I was struggling in San Diego, and oh, the next yeah. thing you know, you've got one of the best managers in the history of baseball, even at that time. Mm -hmm. Bringing you in, saying, "Look, we just need you to be you." Like, I mean, I think a lot of managers, at, 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 even still today, would go, "All right, we got to change you. We got, we got to get you back. We got to do this." We, and he's literally telling you, "Look, if you can just be you, that's who we signed." Like that had to do a ton for you uh, psychologically. Uh, my confidence went off the chart, and I looked at him. I'm like, "Wow." I mean, I, I, I can't explain it. I'll do the best. I or to articulate it, it's like a gorilla jumped off my back. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes, it is a results-oriented business. You do not get paid unless you win at the highest level. But I never felt like the performance, that my performance was thought of as like an end-all there in Oakland. It was like, dude, you just take a breath. you got a lot of great players around you. Let's just figure out a way to get you back into the strike zone and just you be you. And then I was like, okay, I can do that. And then it, it got real – I mean, it, we were really good, so that, that helped. Man, we could talk to you all day long, but uh, we want to wrap it up. Uh, we appreciate the time, Storm, and, uh, you know, a man of faith and a, a family man who seemed, you know, has always had his priorities in order. We just uh, – we enjoy the stories, though. We sure do. It's great to, it's great to hear how, you know, guys from Jacksonville can go on and, and, and have, you know, professional careers in sports. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of the guys that are there now. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you, Storm. That's uh, uh, Storm Davis uh, joining us on our Hometown Heroes podcast, brought to you by Lockett Law. Know before you blow. Dan Hick and Denny Thompson. Denny, we'll see you next time. Can't wait.